What's going on? So I want to talk about this topic of Todd White and uh, maybe you didn't hear, but he made a confession uh, where he had repented of not preaching the biblical gospel. And then he goes in to talk about Charles Spurgeon as if he just heard about him for the first time, as well as Ray Comfort. And he reads uh, from, I, I believe it's Hell's Best Kept Secret by Ray Comfort. And he's talking about how rocked he is by all of this, this understanding of the law and using that to find people dead in their sins to show them the grace that God has for them. And the question is, did Todd White really repent? Well, um, I want to read something um, before we go into the biblical answer to that question. And I believe that the best clarity we can give uh, on this topic is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, where scripture says that love seeks the best in people. And I'm going to be honest, I have a real struggle with people who are constantly going online to find videos of other people bashing and ripping into other preachers. Uh, listen, I understand that there are people who are straight up false prophets out there who are preaching things that are deceiving people and sending to, people to an eternity apart from Christ. And it's pretty clear that Paul even calls out people like that. But people who believe in Christ and him crucified and are living in such a way to glorify God with everything that they're doing, I think that us in the church need to be very, very considerate about trying to catch people in the act and trying to catch people for their sins and ripping into people, right? Um, scripture says in John 13, 35, for they'll know you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. And later on goes to say, and they'll know that I came from the Father, talking from Jesus' standpoint, by the way that you love one another. And I believe that the church has really seriously missed the mark on this point. I believe that we're so focused on denominational differences and arguing over a lot of secondary topics a lot of times um, that we completely miss what God is actually doing through in certain individuals. I understand that, that, that Todd White gets a lot of crap for, for what he's said or done and things like American Gospel and all these other things, but I, I just have a hard time, especially when I hear people misquote something that somebody said. Um, I'm not here defending Todd White or defending anybody else for that sake. Um, but I believe that Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 2 uh, ring true today more than ever, where he says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or eloquence of words, but I have determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. The idea is that when we look back in the book of Acts, we see that Paul definitely knows more than Christ and him crucified. Right? He's debating with Jews in the synagogues, right? He's talking to the Bereans, and he's, he's at Mars Hill in Acts 17. And he knows so much that he can get in a theological debate with anybody at any time. Yet, Paul's intentionality, when it came down to it, was he determined to know nothing among them except Christ and him crucified, right? This is a man who, who, who metaphorically back then went to seminary, right? He knew all there was to know, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, right? Circumcised on the eighth day. Like, this man was like the definition of righteous by society and the church's standards at that time. Um, yet he counted all of those things as lost for the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus, and a salvation, a righteousness that didn't come from works of the law, but rather in faith in God. And I want to encourage you and plead with you today that instead of spending so much time criticizing and attacking and beating up other Christians, that we would rather encourage each other in love and in good works when we come together. And that that would be our heart and that that would be our intentionality. Not what we can fault find in the other person, not how we can be legalistic to other people, but rather how we can build each other up as the body of Christ so that Jesus can come back for a spotless bride one day. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that this topic of um, repentance in regards to, or the, or the law used in regards to the gospel isn't important. I understand it's extremely, extremely important. My point though is to say, if we have the constant heart posture of what the last guy did wrong and keeping up with the latest church politics, I believe that we've completely missed God's heart and intention for the body of Christ. He gave us two commands, which is really just one, love God and love people. And a great commission that he gave us in his parting words were make disciples of all nations. And I believe that us as a church, if we can focus on that and focus on the heart of man 
and, and showing them that need for a savior just as Jesus does and then showing them the goodness of God that can lead a man to repentance, I believe that that is going to be the thing that brings the lost to Christ in droves. But even more importantly than that, I believe that the church loving each other radically as Jesus has called us to is going to make the unbelieving world say there's something about those people that I would like. I would recognized before I gave my life to Jesus at the age of 17 that I was the definition of a Pharisee. And the words in Acts 3 pierced me in the heart worse than most words have in the, in the scriptures. And this is where in Acts 3, the lame beggar at the gate called Beautiful, he gains strength in his legs and he runs into the temple praising and rejoicing for what God had just done in his life with his legs, which obviously the spiritual implication there is his also his, his, his actual salvation of his soul, right? And when he's praising, it shows this scene of when they're in the temple, how the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the people who knew the Bible, like the back of their hand, looked at him and, and almost mocked or scorned him for how silly he was being. And you can almost see in that moment this self-righteous laugh turn into a confused and jealous, I want what he has. Like, like I've known God my entire life, but I don't know God like that man does who just gave his life to my heavenly father today. I believe that there's a childlikeness of that faith of just rejoicing and, and manifesting what God just did in our life that will really make the, the, the surrounding worlds jealous of what it is that we have. Scripture makes clear that the, the debating of theological differences and denominational arguments is not what's going to make people want to come to Jesus one day. The, 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 the unbelieving world knows enough what we disagree on and fight on and argue on, but does not know well enough what it is that we actually believe and who we actually stand for and who we actually stand with. Again, do not hear what I'm not saying. I did not just say that I agree with every other Christian or proclaiming Christian. I'm not saying that there's no time to ever say anything negative um, in regards to the, the, the false beliefs of somebody else. But my point is, is you know your heart more than I do. And if you recognize that you're somebody who gets excited and amped up about the opportunity to light into somebody, I would strongly encourage you to check your heart and pray about that area. Because I'm very convinced that God wants to really transform your heart in that area. I lived as somebody who had no problem just slicing anybody and everybody for not agreeing with my biblical understandings at that time. And I recognized um, very, very quickly when I gave my life to Jesus, how that's not God's heart for the church. God's heart is for us to stir up one another in love and in good works. I believe that the church today struggles to believe and understand the concept of grace in their life and the forgiveness of sins because we're so focused on not showing it to people face to face, right? I've got a, a friend of mine, dear friend, and he, I never really knew what gentleness looked like until I saw it in that man's life. It was so hard for me to see what gentleness looked like because I was not somebody who was gentle. But when I saw it in this man's life, I went, that man is the definition of gentleness. Like if I can imagine what Jesus would look like in his meek side of him, it would look like this man over here. And I believe that the reason that the church struggles so much with grace and this feeling that they need to work for this, this salvation of theirs, which we know is a free gift of God, is because they've never received grace from another human being ever in their life because we're so busy nitpicking and fault finding and beating each other up for what we disagree with or said wrong yesterday. Whereas if we would just show people the goodness and grace of God in the midst of them being wrong, that their identity didn't change and God's love for them and righteousness didn't change, none of those things changed, I believe we'd have a lot more people believing and living from a place of the empowerment that grace gives us in our lives.